want to share a quotation with you tonight as we begin from the pen of Francis Bacon. He wrote, and I quote, It is not what we eat, but what we digest that makes us strong. It is not what we gain, but what we save that makes us rich. Not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned. And not what we preach, but what we practice that makes us Christian, unquote. Now, I understand the intent of the quotation, in particular, not what we preach, but what we practice. But I also understand that what we preach determines what we practice. And what Bacon was really advocating is a faith that is lived out in life every day. A faith that is not simply expressed in words, as often may be the case, but in real action. The profession of faith is shallow and meaningless if it is not backed up by a life lived in obedience and service to Christ. You find this to be the uh, core of what Jesus said in Matthew 15 in his indictment of the Pharisees who had indicted his disciples for eating without washing their hands. Jesus' question to them was essentially this, why are you so interested in a man-made tradition and yet so cavalier when it comes to the command of God? God said and felt so strongly about it that he carved it in stone, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with promise. And yet those Jews in the first century of the Pharisaic sect did everything they could to avoid the command. They argued that what we have can be designated as Corban, a gift to God, and therefore it must not be used to support our parents. We can use it for whatever else we choose to use it, but just not to honor mother and father. To that, Jesus said, In vain you do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. You are like the folks that Isaiah described. They draw near to God with their mouth and honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Isaiah 29, verse 13. It's easily done. If we're not careful, we can be guilty of the same. We can insist on meeting every Lord's Day, observing the Lord's Supper every Sunday, making sure that we lift our voices in praise to Him without the accompaniment of any mechanical instruments. We can teach that baptism is a burial or immersion water and that the substitutes of sprinkling and pouring are unacceptable. And all of that would be true but if we walk out of our buildings and we live the remainder of the week like our neighbors and friends who do not share our faith and our commitment to Christ, we failed our Lord and failed Him miserably. The things that I'm going to share with you this evening, I have over the course of the last few years shared with you, not exactly in this fashion. This message has been broken down and shared in other times over a period of a month or longer, but I'm simply going to review tonight, and I want you know, to know at the outset that the alliteration that I'll be using actually comes from a book by Rick Warren entitled The Purpose Driven Church. He also wrote a book entitled The Purpose Driven Life, and I would not in any way uh, commend everything in either of those books and yet there were some thoughts and some use of alliteration that I frankly found very helpful in my efforts to understand and communicate the gospel. I'm going to highlight those that stood out in my judgment tonight because they really do reflect the teaching of scripture and I'm not opposed 
to borrowing and utilizing anything that emphasizes God's word in a way that is memorable and effective. And for me at least, that is the case with the things that I'm sharing with you tonight. Over the course of my preaching, I have found that there have been men who have delivered sermons that just resonated with me in a way that I had never really thought before. And so I will borrow from them because they in turn are merely conveying the truth of God's word in an intelligible manner. Uh, some would say that's plagiarism, but really not if you cite the source and acknowledge that the real source is the Word of God, and these are merely ways in which to communicate it more effectively. Uh, there's a series of sermon books in our library uh, under the heading of the Harderman Tabernacle series. Uh, there are at least four volumes in that series, and though I don't typically recommend uh, uh, sermon books, I would encourage you to read those. There are some sermons that just really stand out, and in case you didn't know it, uh, according to historians, Hardeman borrowed those from Freed. Tim would appreciate that, being a graduate of Freed Hardeman himself. I don't think there's a preacher in the world who's really original. If he is, he's not preaching the truth because everything ultimately gets back to the Word of God. The text that was shared this evening, and thank you, Christian, for doing that, conveys the principle that man has a duty to God. And if we meet that duty, we are successful. If we fail in our duty, uh, we will incur the wrath of God in judgment. And that's true of everyone alive today, everyone who has ever lived, or will live in the future. We are made in the image of our Creator and have a responsibility to Him to do our duty. Now, let's begin by acknowledging that we have a duty to worship God. There's that what I think could be a beautiful text in Hebrews chapter 10. We generally highlight verse 25, but I would encourage you to read the full context of 22 through 25 to see just how important our assemblies are. It led that writer to say that we must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day that is approaching, by the way, is not the Lord's day. Our assemblies are designed to prepare us for the day that is coming where every man and every woman will give an account of the choices made in this life before the judge of the living and the dead. Our coming together in a setting like this is in essence preparing us for the great day that is coming, the day of judgment. And worship in a collective setting like this serves some really important purposes. May I suggest to you that there are ultimately five things that ought to occur in a setting like this as, as we come to worship God. We're here to focus on Him, not ourselves. I think you may have remembered being here this morning that we began with an emphasis from John 4 that our worship is in spirit and in truth. For they that worship the Father must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Who is at the heart of our assembly tonight? Ladies and gentlemen, it is not me. It is not Tim. It is not Kurt who will make the announcements tonight as important as those announcements are. The focus ought to be on God. And everything we say and everything we do in some manner ought to point us upward, heavenward, to God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For we worship the God who created us, the Lord who saved us, the Spirit who provided the inspired word. And if our focus doesn't put us in a position where the spotlight shines on God, then we've missed our purpose. We come together in settings like this 
to be prepared to face what life holds for us out here in the world. Our time together ought to prepare us to face life's problems. And they inevitably come. What do we say over and over again? Every one of us is either just coming out of difficulty, are in the throes of it right now, or it looms on the horizon. How do we handle it? Hopefully, like Job, who said when he lost everything that most people value, his family, his health, and his wealth, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, thither shall I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has not promised us that life will be easy, but he's promised us in the midst of adversity, he will always be at our side and he will show us the way out or through so that we may overcome. That's the argument of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that we face no test or temptation, but what in the midst of it, God will provide a way to overcome. And our time together is to help us deal with the problems that inevitably come through life and come out on the other side, just like Job, better men and women because of it. I don't know how people face the day without faith in God and the realization that in Christ, no matter what, it is well with our soul. So our focus is on God. The things we hear ought to help us face the problems of life that inevitably come and fortify our faith. In many ways, I believe this is where we have failed our young people. We have not given them the information, the material, the teaching that has equipped them to go out into this world and face all the challenges that faith, faith inevitably faces. There really are valid reasons for why we embrace creation over organic evolution as an explanation for origin. There are really valid reasons why we acknowledge Jesus as the Lord and Savior and reject Muhammad and Buddha and all those other imposters. There really are valid reasons why we spend time in this book on a regular basis because it is God's Word. It is unique among all books books ever written for it is inspired authoritative all sufficient and therefore inerrant 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17 and our time together ought to fortify our faith in these things and others too numerous to mention tonight ought to help us as well fulfill our mission our mission hear me our mission is to serve God and lead others to him. Our chief objective in life is not to be famous, not to be popular, not to be powerful, not to be wealthy. And there's nothing necessarily or inherently wrong with any of those things. But they're just not what life is really all about. Our mission is to live for God to fear, respect him, and keep his commandments. Encourage everyone around us to do the same. And it's an ongoing mission. It never ends the side of eternity. And our time together ought to help us achieve the goals that God would have us achieve as we go out into our community. That's our world. And preach the gospel to every creature by the things we do and the things we say and in that order because if the things we say are not validated by the way we live the things we say will not be effective so we must live it and then advocate it and that's really our mission and finally our purpose to worship God in settings like this helps us find our place in his kingdom how many times do you need to hear this? You matter to the maker. You are special, unique. There is no other person in this world just like you. And God knows you. 
and still loves you. And he has a place for you in his kingdom. And thankfully, that place is not the same for all of us. I believe, based on the teaching of our Lord in the course of his ministry, that he clearly recognized the value of every soul and understood that every person had something worthwhile to contribute to the cause we serve. You don't have to be a preacher to serve God effectively. You don't have to lead the singing or teach a Bible class. But you have to find your place and fulfill your purpose. In our study of Romans, we just recently completed chapter 12. And if you were with us, uh, you may remember that Paul likened the church to a body. He does this other times in his writing as well but here in Romans 12 he simply says a body is made up of many members we're not all an eye not all an ear not all feet or hand the body is composed of many members and each member needs to know its place do its duty fulfill its responsibility eyes are designed to see not to hear and feet for walking not hands. And I know there are people who can walk on their hands. I'm certainly not one of them. And even they would not want to get around that way all the time because that's what feet were made for. And hands are not envious of feet because they're not feet. And feet are not envious of hands because they're not hands. Each member understands its place and fulfills its responsibility. And our Lord wants us all to know we have a place in his kingdom, find your place and fulfill God's plan for you in his kingdom. And it may be that you're like the one talent man. There's just one thing that you excel at. Then you might be the five talent man and could do all manner of things. God doesn't really care whether you're one talent or five talent. What he cares about is that the talent you have is being used in his service that you find your place and fulfill your purpose. That's what worship is all about. We cannot do our duty to God and neglect our worship to him. We secondly, our purpose is to be guided by his word. I've already said that this book is unique among all books. Of the making of books, there is no end, and this book could be much larger than it is. Aren't you glad that it isn't? And John concluded his gospel by saying many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in him. If everything were written that could be written, the world itself could not contain it. He's not talking about a lack of storage space. He's simply saying our finite minds are incapable of comprehending everything that could be revealed. And so God limited the revelation to what was necessary. And it's found on the pages of his holy word. Therefore, we have not been left in the dark. We are not left to our own devices. We're not on our own tonight. We have a road map that will take us from where we are to where we need to be. And in relationship to this wonderful road map for life, we have responsibilities. We have to accept its authority. In the 19th Psalm, the psalmist began by asserting that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament his handiwork and that this is universally true. On a clear night you gaze into the heavens and you know, you just know that there is a God. But what the heavens reveal is God's existence, not his will. For that you need his word. And so that same 19th Psalm from verse 7 through 11 extols the virtues of the written word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Read the text. He concludes by saying of the written word that it's more precious than gold. 
yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them there's great reward. What a transformation in the hearts and minds of people when they come to know the value of the book and accept its authority. The definitive answer to any question about God and God's will for our lives comes from God's Word. The question we ask is not, what does your preacher say? What does your church teach? And I'm bar borrowing the vernacular of the language of the world when I raise these questions because this is what is asked out here in the world. What's your preacher say? What's, what's your church teach? When the real question, if you read Romans and Galatians, is simply what saith the scripture? What has God revealed? I have been interested, I've spoken in a number of lectureships in the last few years and been introduced. And this is the introduction that I have gotten several times now. We remember Roger because he always just preaches the Bible. And I'm thinking, what else should any of us be preaching? The last time that happened, I was followed up by a fellow who spent most of his message talking about the ridge across the Gali River in southern West Virginia. Now he was trying to convey by means of that bridge an illustration of a matter that didn't need illustrating. So many of the illustrations that I hear anymore in sermons are illustrating things that are so plain and simple and clear that you don't need any further thing. You state what the Bible says and we get it and we move on. But that would require being a student of the Bible and that's hard work. Go back again and reread our text for tonight. Study is work. It is not easy. I suspect that there are probably eight out of ten of you who said during your education, I just can't wait to get out of school. I hate it. It's too much work. And it is. I wouldn't argue with you about it. But how do you learn? You work at it. And if you want to know God's word and be guided by it, Except its authority, you need to spend time in it. And a lot of time. For a lifetime. Except its authority. But if you just say, yes, this is the Bible, and I believe every word of it from cover to cover. But you don't act upon it. What good does that do you? So you not only accept its authority, you have to assimilate its truth. Isn't that what Jesus was saying when he concluded the Sermon on the Mount with the story of the wise and the foolish builder? What differentiated between the wise and the foolish? They both heard the same thing, but only one acted on what was heard, and he was wise. The fool heard, he just didn't do anything about what he heard. So accept its authority, and then assimilate its truth. Ask in life on a regular basis when you face challenges and questions, what does the Bible say? And then get into the Word to find out. You want to know how to raise children? Don't read Dr. Spock. Read the Word of God. You want to know how to build a really sound and lasting marriage? This is what you do. You read it, you accept it, and you follow it. I can't think of a single situation in life that we will ever encounter but what God does not provide an answer to our question. But we have to accept the authority of Scripture and then assimilate its truths into our word or into our life while we adopt its principles for daily living. What do I mean by adopting principle? Matthew 7, 12, the golden rule, treat people the way you would want to be treated. So profoundly simple and yet profoundly difficult because that's not the nature of human nature. But when we are guided by his word, we are compelled to adopt the principles of that word and to treat others not as we are treated by them, 
but as we would want to be treated by them. When faced with the dilemma, do I tell the truth or not? Would you want to be lied to? Well, of course not. So we could not ever defend lying to someone else. You see where I'm going with that? There are basic principles for life contained in this book, and they need to be adopted in the lives of the saints. You see, it's not just what we preach, but it's also what we practice. It's not just what we hear, but it's what we remember and act upon. And that's the point. Accept its authority, assimilate its truth, adopt its principles, and yes, even apply its power. How do we bring lost souls to Christ? Not by getting the most eloquent orator to deliver his word, because the power is not in the messenger. The power resides in the message. Paul said to the saints at Rome, as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It is the power of God's word that changes hearts and lives. The message of the gospel, the good news of Christ, not the messenger that needs to be highlighted. This is a powerful book. If only people will acknowledge its origin from above, accept its authority, assimilate its truths, adopt its principles, and apply its power. Our duty is to worship God. Our duty is to be guided by his word. We have a duty to understand our real purpose in life. And what is that in a succinct way? to simply be children of God. John wrote in 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. There just isn't a greater honor than the one given to us when God invites us into his family. In Romans chapter 8, Paul put the focus on Jesus, God's Son, and the one who paid the penalty for our sin. And he said to the saints at Rome, and thus saints in every age, that we too are children of God. Heirs of God, he said, and joint heirs with Christ. We're part of the family, we're in the Father's will, and we can call on the Father as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Abba, Abba, or Father, Father. Because that's the relationship that we sustain as people of God. Our purpose is to be a child of the Creator and to live as God's children ought to live. Regarding God's purpose for us, here's what it boils down to, to be a member of his family. Part of the household of faith that Peter, or pardon me, Paul talked about when he said to Timothy, these things have I written to you, hoping to come unto you shortly, but if I tarry, that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house or family of God, which is the church, the pillar and support of truth. God, more than anything else, wants us to be his child, his son or daughter, with Jesus as our elder brother, and as a member of his family, he wants us to model his character. What did Peter write in 1 Peter? Quoting from the law, Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. The church at Corinth and thus saints in every age are compelled. Come out from among them the world and be separate, sanctified, that's the concept, or holy, saith the Lord. 
He wants his people to follow after holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. And when Isaiah spoke of a way, a way so clearly marked that the fool should not err therein, Isaiah 35, 8, he said, it is the way of holiness. Do we model the character of Christ? So when people see us, they see a reflection of him. Isn't that precisely what Paul said he did when he said to the saints in the churches of Galatia, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. We are living letters, writing every day for the world to read. A message that either points men heavenward by modeling the character of our Father and our Savior or leads them astray by our failure to live as Christ lived. We're to be magnifiers of his glory. This goes back to the purpose of worship again. Our focus is not on ourselves but on our God and our Savior. We want the spotlight to shine on them. In Matthew 6, in the first 18 verses, when Jesus talked about uh, doing good deeds, alms in the King James translation, and fasting and prayer, he said nothing negative about any of those things. In fact, these are things that still ought to characterize people of God. We ought to do good deeds. It is appropriate to fast, and certainly we ought to pray and pray often. But if you look at those 18 verses, Jesus said these are things that should be done in such a way that the light does not shine on us. If we put the light on us, men will applaud, but God will pay no attention. So when you do good deeds, do them so that they remain between you and the Lord and God who sees in secret will reward openly. And the same thing is true when you fast or when you pray. It's not for show. If it becomes a show, God doesn't have a ticket to that. But when it's personal and private, when you enter into the sanctum of your own closet and pour out your heart to God, he will hear and he will respond. Do you magnify his glory? Are you a minister, a servant of his grace? There's a song that says he has no hands but our hands, no feet but our feet, no mouth but our mouth. How does God work today? Most of the time through his people. To be a minister of his grace is simply to be a servant of the divine task. To live so that the love, mercy, and grace of God the forgiveness of Christ is found in the hearts and lives of saints. And then we're to be messengers of his word. Our responsibility, it's just that our responsibility is to be a mouthpiece for the master. You might like to think that that's just why we pay a preacher, but not so. I can reach a limited number of people. There are folks in your circle that I may never have the opportunity to teach, but they still need taught. And he, who needs to do that? You. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's the instruction from Paul to Timothy. We are all messengers of God's word and ministers of his grace. To fulfill our mission and understand our purpose means that these things are essential. Further, he has given us a purpose to live for, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, a people to live with. We need to be part of the body. There are folks I think sometimes well-intentioned but totally wrong who think they can get to heaven without the support and encouragement of fellow saints. But that's not so. God designed the church the way he did and our sim assemblies the way they are because all of us need the encouragement that comes from them. How did I get there? He's given us principles to live by. 
Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. You see how all of these things tie together? He's given us a profession to live out. We're his children, and we live our lives reflecting that relationship. And yes, he's given us power to live on. And by the way, it's 2 Timothy 1.7 tonight. Last week it was 1 Timothy 1.7. It's corrected this evening in this text. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. We ought to be able to go out and face the day with absolute courage, knowing that we're not alone. And although we might be weak and miserable and lowly and powerless, when God stands at our side, we are dramatically transformed into an invincible force for good and right. Now, I said all of that so I could say this in conclusion. The most uncomfortable person in the world is one who has just enough religion to make him uneasy. Not enough to be enjoyed, but too much to be ignored. I've met a lot of people that, in my mind, that was the religion that they professed. And they never, never discovered the real joy of being a true disciple of Christ. The fullest life we can live, and this is something I, I've tried desperately for years to get young people to understand. The fullest life we can live will be lived as a Christian. The devil would say, if you are a follower of Jesus, that will just sap the fun out of living. It takes the joy out of life. But that's not true. And the devil is a liar. The father of lies, John 8, 44. It really is so. You want a really good life. Live the good life that God calls you to live as a Christian. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10, 10. Further, we're not left to our own devices. It would be frustrating and frightening if we had to sort it all out on our own. But we don't, remember? We have a roadmap. The challenge is to look at it, to read it, to accept its authority, and follow it. And it really isn't as hard as the devil would have you believe. So I will ask this question tonight. In conclusion, have you discovered God's purpose for your life? And are you fulfilling it? If not, isn't it time to start? We're going to sing the song that Tim has selected. You have the opportunity to come in faith, repentance, confession. We will immerse you in Christ. His blood will wash away your sins. He will add you to his church, and you can leave this place determined to discover and fulfill your purpose, your God-given purpose, and live abundantly and eternally because you